Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Sana and today I'm going to talk about everything you need to know about the physics aptitude test in 2025. This is a bit different from the normal videos that I've been making. Usually I make vlogs about my life but some people requested this video so I thought I should make it. For those of you that don't know you need to do the physics aptitude test when you apply to do physics physics and philosophy, engineering or material science at the University of Oxford. I did the test a while ago in 2019 and I got accepted for an interview which I then passed and received an offer to study physics. Since then I've graduated with my BA in physics from the University of Oxford so I feel like I'm a bit qualified to make this video. I remember when I was studying for the test there weren't that many resources on YouTube to help people prepare and I checked again and there seems to be some by Jesus College Oxford but they just really seem to be that many. So in this video I really want to cover absolutely everything you need to know. I've got my notes all written down so in this video we're going to talk about how to prepare for the PAT, what are the resources available to you, my experience doing the 2019 paper and also my past paper scores and then once you've done the test how does Oxford shortlist for interviews. This video is going to be pretty long and pretty comprehensive so let's get into it. Okay so first things first you actually need to register for the exam. So the test is actually computer based now and it's on a screen and you need to take it at an authorized test center. In the past I think your school used to register for you and you could take it in your school but that's completely changed now. You have to make sure that you yourself register for the exam. Okay so essentially to actually do the test you need to register for it, book it and then turn up to the actual exam. So from June, July, August, September, I think it opens so you can start registering for the exam and you need to fill in some basic information to register for the exam. Once you've registered, I think in around August, September, you actually book your exam. The test usually takes place around the end of October and make sure when you've booked the test, you have your confirmation email. If you didn't get the confirmation email, make sure you go back and double check you actually booked the right thing. The Oxford website has a very detailed 10 minute video on on how to register and book and they have a step-by-step -step guide so make sure to check that out. Okay so let's go into how to actually prepare for the physics aptitude test. The first thing I would recommend is copying the syllabus from the Oxford website and using it as a checklist. Most of the stuff on the list will be stuff that you've done in AS maths and physics but there'll probably be some things that you haven't covered before. It's up to you to make sure that you've done all of the topics and if you haven't done any then you need to make sure that you learn those topics. For the topics that you haven't yet covered in class what I would recommend is talking to your teacher at school and asking advice on how to learn those topics. Depending on how supportive your school is or how much time your teacher has they might help you study for those topics but if not then it's up to you to read through the textbook and make sure you know the content. Personally I hadn't covered some of the physics topics yet and I had to personally learn it through the textbook. If you're only doing A-level maths then there'll definitely be some parts on the math syllabus that you haven't yet covered and I think the integration and differentiation are the key topics to practice. Usually people that are doing A-level maths and further maths would have done more integration and differentiation practice so usually they would be better at those topics. Because calculus is such a key topic I would definitely recommend focusing and making sure you're set on these topics. Okay so once you have your syllabus how do you actually revise? Honestly, when you're doing the part, I would say the best place to be in is to know all of your A-level knowledge back to front. Just do your normal revision, make sure you know all of your equations, all of your derivations, and you just know everything so solidly. Once you have all of the basics grounded and set in place, the next step is to really start applying that knowledge. Usually when you do the part, you'll realize that it's not normal questions and you have to apply your knowledge and think a bit out of the box more. Because of this, you need to get used to the style of questions, so I would recommend doing past papers. All of the past papers for the part are on the Oxford website and you can actually access all of them freely. Doing these past papers will help you get used to the style of questions on the exam and also help you get used to the timed conditions. One thing to know is that you actually don't get a formula sheet when doing the PAT which is quite different from your A-levels so definitely make sure that you remember all of the equations and if not remembering the equations make sure you know all
all of the derivations that you can do in the exam. One thing to note is that I think they've actually stopped releasing past papers for the recent exams because they've changed to an online format, but I definitely recommend doing all of the past papers. I think it's from 2006 onwards, I would definitely recommend doing all of them. So I actually started doing my past papers in around mid-August, I think. I started doing one a week. When I was doing my revision, I definitely got through all of the past papers. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about were the Oxford PAT reports. If you don't know about these, they're also freely accessible on the Oxford website. Essentially, every year, Oxford releases a report about the exam that year. It contains key information like how many people applied for the test, what was the distribution of marks for that year, and what was the average mark. And one thing you'll realize is that in the past, Oxford used to release a cutoff mark. So if you got higher than this mark, you'd automatically get shortlisted for an interview. But actually, recently they've changed that and they don't have a set cutoff. They actually look at your contextualized GCSE data plus your PAT score to decide who will get through to an interview. So sometimes it can be a bit hard to tell if you did good enough to pass. They also don't release how they contextualize your GCSE data. So I'd really just recommend doing the best that you can in all of the past papers and aim for the highest mark you can in the actual exam. There are also other resources that you can access other than past papers. So on the Oxford website itself, it has other resources which you can use to prepare for the PAT. Some of these are more helpful than others and I'll go through the key ones which I thought were the most helpful. I did the test so long ago that they actually didn't have this resource when I was doing the paper, but they actually have a course called Preparing for the PAT. It's essentially online classes where they help you prepare for the PAT and it's run by the university, so I would definitely recommend checking it out. Obviously I haven't personally done it so I can't tell you any of my personal opinions but obviously it's run by the university so there's no harm in checking it out. For me the most helpful resource was the British Physics Olympiad. Guys if you don't know what an Olympiad is it's essentially a set of questions and all of the schools are in competition and if you pass uh, each round you'll kind of progress and then there's semi-finals and finals and I think there's a prize at the end on who did like the best. So usually schools will do this um, even if you're not preparing for the pie it's just a regular competition but I found the papers are really helpful when preparing for the PAT. So Oxford recommends having a look at these papers and I think I did around three or four papers. One thing I thought that was really helpful about the Olympiad was that it helps you uh, get introduced to new concepts and new ideas and how to answer a question when you have no idea what's going on. So when you do the PAT you'll realize that sometimes they'll ask you a question about an experiment that you've never done before. So you really need to get into a good way of thinking about a concept you haven't done before and how to answer and apply your knowledge to this new idea. So the British Physics Olympiad definitely helps with that. The next resource I would recommend is the Isaacs Physics website. Website. This is actually a website made by Cambridge. The questions on this website are usually longer and require more manipulation of your equations, so it's a really good thing to start doing those questions. The website is really good because sometimes they'll even tell you how far off your answer is, and if you've made a common error, sometimes they'll point it out to you and give you a hint, so it's a bit more interactive. Usually with these questions, if I got stuck on some, I would actually go and ask my physics teacher for help, but yeah, I would definitely recommend checking this one out. So the next resource that Oxford lists on their website is Next Time Physics. These questions are more abstract and to be honest I don't think they were super super helpful for the PAT but it helps you get used to new ideas and new concepts and this is also really helpful for interview questions so if you have some time outside of your usual PAT practice I would definitely recommend checking out this website. Okay so I'm going to talk about my actual revision plan that I did when I was studying for the PAT. Okay so when I did the PAT as I mentioned before before I started revising in mid-August and I did around one paper a week. Actually it used to be my routine where I would come home from school every Friday night and do a paper and mark it and because I'm a nerd I actually enjoyed this part of the week. So Oxford doesn't actually release solutions online so I used a different website to look at the solutions and actually once school started in September I used to ask my physics teacher for help on any of the questions that I got stuck on. Obviously it depends on how busy your teachers are and how supportive you school is but luckily for me my teacher used to help me out and alongside these past papers I was also doing Isaac physics and Olympiad questions throughout the week. So one thing I did which actually wasn't listed on the Oxford website but I actually did the Cambridge entrance exam for natural sciences as practice. I think it was called the NSAA which doesn't exist anymore and I think they 
actually have the ESA instead. But I used to do the physics and maths questions on this paper for practice. And obviously the format and everything was completely different, but obviously you're still applying the same equations and the same logic. So I used to use this as practice. I think I ended up doing around two to three papers of this. So if you have time, I would definitely go and check it out. Okay, so next I'm actually going to talk about my past paper scores. Honestly, when I was revising for the PAT, I was the only person revising, so I had no idea what kind of scores anyone else was getting. So I'm going to go through and talk about all of the scores that I was getting in my past papers just to help you guys out with your anxiety. Obviously I did my actual exam in 2019 so that's the last score that I have. I'll talk about all of the historic scores. I've got all of these scores written down by the way so I'm just going to go through and read them all out. So in 2006 I got 44 and I think the cutoff was actually 45 so I did not pass. In 2007 I got 52 and the cutoff was 47 so I did pass. In 2008, I got 63 and the cutoff was 52. So that's actually pretty good. I got 10 marks above the cutoff. In 2009, I think I actually lost the paper but the cutoff was 47. I don't know what I got. In 2010, I got 74 and the cutoff was 71. So if you look at the cutoffs for 2010 and 2009, you'll realize there's a 24 mark difference. So the main aim when you do the part is just to do as best as you possibly can because you never know what everyone else will be getting. This kind of makes it a bit more stressful to be honest. Okay, so in 2011, I actually did this paper twice because I did so badly on it. The first time I got around 31 and the second time I got 44 and the cutoff was 50. So I did not reach the cutoff both times, which is kind of embarrassing to be honest. I'm just glad those topics went on the 2019 paper because I don't know how I would have done. So in 2012, I got 46 and the cutoff was 51. In 2013, I got 58 and the cutoff was 68. In 2014, I got 41 and the cutoff was 55. In 2015, I got 68 and the cutoff was 65. In 2016, I got 60 and the cutoff was 60. In 2017, my score was 44 and the cutoff was 59. In 2018, I got 53 and the cutoff was 62 and then in 2019 they got rid of the cutoff and changed how they shortlisted for interviews and use that contextualized data instead. Okay so now I want to talk about my actual experience sitting the paper in 2019. So I actually did the paper um, when it was like a real actual paper so obviously it was a long time ago but genuinely I remember it as if it was yesterday. I walked into the exam hall feeling pretty confident because I'd put in a lot of work and I genuinely felt like I was so good at physics at that point. I felt like this was the best I'd ever been at physics and I was ready to just do the best that I could in that exam. As soon as I opened up the paper the first thing that I did was flick through and read all of the questions just to see which ones uh, looked harder, which ones I'd have to spend more time on and which ones I could get the most marks. So back when I did the paper it wasn't a fully multiple choice exam and actually depending on my working I could get more points um, just on the working even if I did didn't get my final answer correct. Obviously that's now changed and it's a fully multiple choice exam which makes it a bit harder because you don't get those working points. And one of the first things I noticed when I opened up the paper was that there weren't many maths questions. For me maths is my strong point so I was really disheartened to see that there weren't that many maths questions and I had a bit of a panic at the start of the exam and I fully just sat there for a couple of minutes just panicking because I just felt like I wouldn't be able to get a good score. To be honest I had to kind of pull myself together at that point because I'm applying to study physics at Oxford but I was panicking that there weren't maths questions so I had to just remind myself that I was also good at physics. But yeah I, I honestly wasted like a few minutes at the start just sitting there panicking. But then the rest of the exam I just tried to put as much down as I could for each question and to be honest it wasn't as bad as I thought. However I think there were two questions I actually struggled to put anything down but obviously doing those Olympiad questions really helped because I managed to put some equations down and some working even though I had no idea what was going on. So I walked out of that exam feeling pretty okay even though I had that panic at the beginning I managed to like pull myself together. So one thing I haven't mentioned previously in this video but actually two weeks before I did the exam my teacher gave me a really old physics textbook. 
She basically just gave it to me to have a look at and read through just out of interest. It's really old and the topics don't come up on the A-level anymore and some of the experiments aren't even on the Olympiad, Isaac Physics or anything like that. However, at that point, I'd pretty much finished a lot of my other revisions. So my teacher just gave it to me to uh, have a read and see what I could get out of it. So one of the topics on this uh, textbook was the air cell refractometer. The air cell refractometer, basically you shine a light on this kind of box and depending on the angle of incidence, you can work out the refractive index of the material. And to be honest, when I was reading it the night before my paper, it seemed like pretty much irrelevant information and it was such a random physics experiment. Guess what came up on my exam the next day? <laughs> One of the questions that came up was on the air cell refractometer. Guys, I knew exactly the equation that they wanted me to derive and that question was just so easy for me. And actually at the time I was feeling super tired and just thinking, oh, why am I doing such last minute revision? But I ended up just reading about the experiment anyway and I just can't believe that it actually came up on my paper. To be honest, I was pretty lucky but I'm just glad luck was on my side on that day. So the reason why I didn't mention reading textbooks like this as a method of revision was because it's not a good way to revise. If you're one or two weeks away from the exam and you've done all of the other methods, then you can randomly pick up a textbook and read up on random experiments, but it's really inefficient because you never know what's gonna come up. But yeah, if you're running out of things to do, definitely just start reading up on any type of physics that you can. Okay, so I did also wanna talk about um, that time period in general to be honest august september october november was a really difficult time period for me because there was just so much going on and so much revision that i had to do and i know a lot of you will be in the same boat where you have like your ucas application your personal statement you have to you know revise for your a levels revise for the exam also prepare for interviews so this time period is really hard to be honest and i would definitely just recommend when you're taking a break make sure you actually take a break and take your mind off things um, because it can get really tough if you're constantly thinking about this all the time. Okay, so the final thing I'm going to talk about is how they shortlist after the PAT for interviews. So essentially, the PAT is used to narrow down the number of candidates. So I had a look at the report for 2024 and the number of applicants per place was around 9.4 applicants before the PAT and after the test, they narrowed it down to roughly 2.8 applicants per place, including some um, mitigating circumstances people. So this means that they roughly quartered the number of candidates just from the PAT. So as I mentioned before, there isn't a set cutoff point um, for the PAT on who will get an interview. They actually have a look at your contextualized GCSE data plus your PAT score and then they'll give people interviews based on that. So in terms of rough numbers, maybe they'll give 300 people an interview based on their GCSE score and PAT score and then they might add in maybe an extra 80 people um, based on mitigation mitigating circumstances and other contextualized factors. So really at this point, you can't change your GCSE score. So you really have to make sure you do the best that you can on the path. I'm gonna end the video on a list of final advice. Use a syllabus as your foundation, revise your AS content thoroughly. And if you haven't done further maths A-level, make sure you practice your calculus skills. Do every past paper you can under timed conditions. Supplement your revision with Isaac Physics and Olympiad questions. Plus try and sign up for the Oxford Uni course. And most importantly, stay calm and adaptable. So that's the end of the video. I hope you guys found it helpful and if you have any more questions let me know in the comments and I do my best to answer them. And if you're interested to watch my vlogs while I was at uni be sure to check out those as well. I'll end the video here so thanks everyone for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.